So welcome to the very first React.js meetup in Binet. So yeah, let's give it a applause. So uh, this is the, as, as I said before, that this is the very first time we do a React.js meetup in Binet itself. And uh, just want to ask, is like anyone first time in this building? Okay, so most of you guys know where is it, right? So I just want to do a, a very short uh, housekeeping. Toi uh, washroom toilet is over there, so you just turn one new shape. Okay, if you want to release yourself, go and relieve yourself, okay? Don't have to ask for permission, don't need to raise hand and then whatever, whatever. So um, I, we appreciate you guys spend your afternoon on Saturday here. And we really appreciate that you here, you are, you are here, then hopefully that you can learn something in the next four hours. All right. So um, this meetup is co-organized by uh, Inang Dev Circle from Facebook. So they are the one that uh, you know sponsor our refreshment, and we also have a sporting partner of Hikat, which is the co-working space in here. So in case you guys haven't heard of it, so this is a, actually a state sponsor. Project, state government sponsor projects. So there's a co coking uh, space over there, and then they organize that. Okay, so they organize that event from time to time. So if you're interested in uh, some of the tech events that they have, I will suggest you to follow them on Facebook. So they have like at least one one event per week. All right. So. Next is, uh, this is, uh, we, the React Binet community is pretty much new. So this is our Facebook group. So hopefully you guys are already in there. If you're not in there, uh, please join here. So we are uh, just a bunch of uh, React lovers and we are also develop and use React on our daily basis on our, our work, our projects for our clients and stuff. So uh, we, we don't really have the link in terms of like this meetup and everything else uh, in, in, in the community as itself. So we, we, we sort of like practice uh, the so-called the Roman Senate style, meaning that at each time we will, you know, uh, appoint, appoint someone to organize the meetup and then we will organize the meetup, okay? So this time it is my turn, so next time it will be a different link to organize the meetup. So the structure itself, uh, it's going to be once every quarter, meaning that once every three months. The, the reason is we try to keep things fresh, and then so that's why that uh, the meetup is quite different with the other meetup because most of the other meetup normally do on at night. So, but we choose it on Saturday afternoon so that so that everyone you know have the time to attend, and you know parking here is is a uh, is troublesome. So Saturday, yeah, nobody gonna you, you won't have any parking problem. Okay, on Saturday. So as I mentioned before, that we're going to have a different lead. So each time there will be like a different lead to organize the meetup. So this time it's me, and then the other time you'll be a different, different uh, person. So if you are interested to uh, do your own React.js meetup, let us know. We can help you. But you're going to do the lead, but we can support you on some, some other stuff like the venue, the logistic part, and then the, the, the refreshment and stuff and stuff, all right? So we welcome anyone who want to host their own uh, React.js meetup. Let us know, we can help as much as we can, okay? All right? And uh, it will be also in different format as well. So this one, is, of course, is, it, uh, is very, very obvious that this is a talk uh, presentation style meetup. So later on, we might have a different, different kind of uh, meetup. For example, there might be a workshop, like a uh, half-day workshop, uh, they focus on React yes, or maybe React Native as well. And we might also have a code jam section and a study group. So this is much more casual, like we talk together and then we go together in, in React, of course, obviously. And then we might have a competition like Hackathon in the future, but okay, this is for the future. So I'm, I'm not promising anything right now. So again, uh, please join our group if you ever join it. And next is I'll pass, I'll introduce the Lead, uh, no, the lead of uh, Penang Dexagon, uh, Gui. So he will uh, give an introduction on Dexagon. So, uh, hi, I'm Gui. I'm the lead for uh, Dexagon Penang. So, um, it will be a very short uh, introduction. So, 
um, we just started our main um, this year, and then this is our group. Uh, please join because we will have events every month. We are looking for the next event for next month. So if you are in the group, you will be able to know which um, events is um, organized by Dev Circle Finance. Okay. So this is the agenda for the day. Uh, just a song that you will be able to uh, know what this event is. So let's stop it. Thank you. So um, I forgot that I have to introduce myself. So my name is Nathan. I'm a freelance developer. So I practice uh, Reg.js uh, quite frequently as well. So today what I'm going to talk about is like how to learn React.js. So this is um, uh, suitable for beginner and intermediate and of course for advanced people as well. Like how you're going to improve yourself in React. Okay, alright. So this is a little bit about me. I'm a freelance developer. I, uh, I self-taught myself on coding. So I started my career as a WordPress developer. And but gradually I moved towards uh, React.js and uh, web development, uh, Node.js and Firebase. And so I'm just curious, like, um, who are you, right? What's your level in React.js? So who's here just getting started? Wow, okay, good, quite a lot of you. Anyone here write React.js regularly? Okay. So who's the master? No, 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 no. I'm this guy. <laughs> Okay, so no master here, right? If you're a master, then you're gonna talk in here, not me. Okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a brief, a brief story about how I might encounter with React.js yes, myself. So um, my first encounter with React.js yes, is back in uh, 2015. So it's about four years ago. So this is the, the so-called uh, project file. So uh, just for, for your information. This project is no longer, uh, I abandoned it for this project a long time ago. So, but this is a, one of my very first projects that I, I, I do. So, if you notice that uh, the structure is quite different with the React right now, for those that already know what is React is, then you will realize that why it's so much so, so different, different, right? You notice that there's no web app, and then there's no source file, there's only app, and then uh, most of the stuff are pretty much the same. So this is uh, the package file that we used back then, four years ago. So there's a few things that you'll notice that, uh, first thing, back then we used GXX uh, file. Right now it's just JavaScript file. So by, I, I also don't understand why back then we have to use like the GXX file. Alright, then uh, four years ago we used Groot for compiling because that's so right back then. So you can imagine the hustle and then you always get an error and you don't know what the heck the error is. Okay. And then um, we use reflux for redux and reflux I think it has been I don't think any I think Facebook team maybe still use it, but out of that I don't think anyone else can use it because I mean I mean this thing is really difficult to understand. So luckily we have Redux right now. So and also you notice that this is also pre ex era. So this is ex5. So imagine uh, back then how difficult is it to, to learn React? And we also I mean I mean compared to right now, right? I mean right now if you want to learn React JS, you pretty much Google. You can get a lot of courses. Some are free, some are paid. I mean even you can go to Udemy and then pay maybe like ten bucks. Then you get a full course. But back then, we have to learn it by reading other people's code, which is, uh, I mean, how much you can get from there, right? Because uh, back then, we, our, the community is really, is really small compared to right now. So, um, compared to today, there's a lot of resources online. Especially like if you go to dev2, dev.tu. Dev2, there's a lot of articles written by developers themselves. In case this presentation that I'm going to give, a lot, of, uh, not, a lot of articles are actually referring back to them. Alright, so um, so there's, for those that is like learning right now or new, there's really no reason why you, you are not going to learn React.js because it's much so much more easy compared to back then. Alright, so okay, but the question is, most people ask me is like, you know why React? You know why not other thing? So I'm going to tell you why React and not the other framework or the other 
coding language or, or so, so on and so on. Alright? So this is a very basic uh, working form. So what they do is like, okay, uh, okay, so here is a home page, you click on login, then you fill out your details, and then you log in, then you get data, then you get uh, your user data, and then you can log out. Okay, so it's a simple login form, and then you can pretty much create with any web technologies. It doesn't mean that you have to create with React. So, like, what we need is normally, uh, we need a home page to decide that if it's a login, then we'll show the login link, meaning that the user already logged in. If they haven't logged in yet, then probably we'll show a login link. Then we have a login, probably have a login page. And then we'll capture the username. And then we'll submit the credential of. Yeah, spoiler. <laughs> okay, so we'll submit credential to the backend, and then once we get the credential back, we'll probably redirect the user back to the home page. Okay? So this is a very simple uh, layout. So if you do this in the normal HTML, CSS, uh, GQ way, you probably gonna need this script, uh, this profile. You have a home page, HTML. You have a login, HTML. Then you have a script to write your GQ script. Then a uh, style .css to run your CSS. All right. So this uh, uh, for a long time, this is pretty much how we work in web. All right. Doesn't mean uh, doesn't matter whether you are using PHP, Ruby on Rails, or some other framework, but it pretty much you know go down to this concept. All right. We always have HTML, JavaScript, and CSS form. So uh, our login file will probably like this. Okay. So this is the form. Then we probably have a one input line, input line, and then a button to submit. And then there's a script. And then we refer to jQuery. And then there's a CSS as well. All right. This is a simple HTML file. And for our CSS, so we probably return it in this way. And then we probably have a, a jQuery script to detect the button on click. And then we call an AJAX to our backend. To get back the data, and then once we get back the data, we probably need to redirect back the home page again. All right. So this is uh, how the normal way, or the, the traditional way, is doing doing uh, the login form. So as I say that uh, for the past maybe twenty or thirty years, this has been always our our way of doing things. Maybe twenty years because CSS is not like more than thirty years. So it's always like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript file. It's always these three files. It doesn't matter which framework you're using. It's always these three files. So, uh, but it's not really anymore because of the uh, JavaScript framework that we are in. We have right now, like, so in in React, right? We pretty much simplify everything because in React, if you want to do this, all we need is possible to do to do it with just an index for JS. Okay, it's possible. But most of us we don't do it that way because normally we bring out like component to component. Just for the sake of human who reading it, but it is possible to do it just with one file. So compared to to last time, we always have to write simply separately. Like we have to write our HTML markup in one file, we have to write our CSS in another file, we have to write our script in JavaScript in another file. So it always these three files combined together we get the layout that we want. But in React, we can simplify to do just in one file everything in here. And then we can turn from there. All right. So okay, it's, it's okay if, if you if you couldn't, couldn't read it. But this is the basic of a, a React uh, code. So uh, like what you see before, there's a HTML structure in here, which is similar to the HTML structure. And then there's a styling. I use in my styling. Okay. And then. Uh, there's an action trigger. So when the value change, what we're gonna do? So as you can see, that React combined all those three files into one simple React JS file. All right. So comparison, like back then, you have to write multiple files, but right now you probably only have to like write one JavaScript. That's why they say that um, in the future you might even able to build a rocket ship with JavaScript because right now JavaScript is everywhere. It's in your web, it's in your mobile, it's in your desktop. So some of the some of the things that you use, you might not aware that it came with JavaScript instead of like their own native code. 
So that's how powerful JavaScript is and going forward. And, and this is the direction that for web development, this is probably the direction that we are going forward. In maybe in, in four or five years later, maybe React <coughs> might not exist anymore. Might be some other open source framework that are going to replace it. But I would say that JavaScript is still here. Because JavaScript has been here for around, I think, more than 20 years, since, since the 90s. So, but they are still here, and then they are going very strong right now. So, in the future, hopefully, then we might see the JavaScript <coughs> in almost every, every other uh, field. Alright? So, let's see if like, we want to create this login form, how we can create this in React. So, in normally, what we're going to do is we have a React class, and then we render the code in here. So here, right, we can detect like, whether there's an authentication data or not. Is, is there any user credential in here? If there's a user credential, then probably I'll just render a home page. If not, probably I'll just render a login page. Okay, login form. Then here is where I get the data from uh, <coughs> our, my backend using Redux. I'm going to talk about this later on, but I'm just going to try, try to like, demonstrate for you like, how React works, okay? So then we probably have a, a handle click here to, to, uh, to listen for the event by the user. Okay. So this is the login form in here. So here we have uh, we can detect our changes from the input form itself, then the password form and then on click then we can do something in, in here. Alright? So this is the basic of React. Yeah. Now uh, some of the code here is not uh, the so called standard practice because I just will show showcase the power of React. Yeah. So this is not definitely not the best practice, alright? Next is, uh, so like for example, once they log in, then there's a data in here, then I'll just render the whole, okay? So this is how, how React does compared to like the normal HTML, JS, uh, CSS, and JavaScript. So here we can actually do it all in one file, all right? So now you understand like how React works. So right now we're gonna talk about, okay, so right now if you wanna learn React, what should you learn first and what is the first step? Alright? So here's the roadmap to learn React.js. <coughs> and of course, uh, we're gonna start with level zero because you have to learn HTML and CSS. I mean, this is pretty obvious, right? So after all, this is web. So you have to understand what is like HTML markups and then what is the CSS. Otherwise, there's no point you go and learn React right now because uh, this is the basic of all web development. But I don't know whether we uh, JavaScript, no matter how powerful JavaScript is it, this is still the basic. Alright? So where to learn HTML and CSS? Uh, personally I think uh, Code Academy has a very tut good tutorial on uh, HTML and CSS and both of them are free. So you can scan this and here's a link here. You can scan this and then uh, learn it on your own if you want to learn it. Alright? So uh, don't worry, I will include a slide in the in our Facebook group later on, so you can click from, from there. So you don't really have to like capture it right now. So uh, optional on level uh, level zero, it is good you learn SAS because uh, SAS simplifies uh, CSS a lot and it makes things really easy. To and and moving forward as well, that uh, SAS going to help you a lot in React. It's not, all right? So here's a very good tutorial that I find in YouTube. It's only 20 minutes and this guy really explained uh, SAS uh, very, very easy to understand on, on the tutorial itself. So you can actually go through here and it's only 20 minutes. And, and I will suggest you go to learn this so that you will understand more about what is SAS. All right? So this is level zero. So right now we go to level one. Level one, of course, is like you must have some JavaScript basics, all right, before you learn React. So what, what, what are the basic things you need to learn? You need to learn uh, EXS classes. You need to learn what is length, what is con constant variable, error function, strategy, assignment, map and filter, and lastly is the module system of ESX. Okay? So these six items you have to learn it before you actually went to React. Otherwise, uh, there's a lot of code that you won't be able to understand because this is the basic of pretty much JavaScript and also the EXX. Of course, there are much um, 
more basic level, like for example, what is what uh, the between the uh, the difference between like array and object and all those all those stuff, the syntax things. I'm not gonna talk about that in here because I expect you should know that because if unless you're not from a programming background, but I I, I hopefully that you're from a programming background, all right? So okay, EXX classes. So EXX classes is like this. Uh, let's say a one class, a developer class. Then there's a hello function, and then there's probably there's a value in here. So in this case, if I call this class and I call this return dot hello, I should be able to generate this string, uh, this string together with my name. All right. So this is the basic of EXS class. So it's if if you notice right, uh, some other programming language also have this sort of structuring thing, like PHP, uh, I think Java as well. So uh, there are probably there are some other uh, programming languages that have the similar things. So this is quite similar with other programming language. And in classes, we also of course we have like inher inheritance, whereby right now I'm gonna this is React developer. I'm gonna extend my previous developer class, and here. I'm still gonna access. I can access back the the whole parent class uh, function, the hello, which is the same as the previous class that I declared here. So, but I can add additional class that's that is unique to this React developer class. So here I can render it uh, whatever string here in here. All right. So so you can even like do uh, uh, like passing value from. The, the child, the parent, and then it still can render it out. Right? So this is the basic of uh, EXS class. Then in React itself, normally the, the way we use it is, is like this. We have the app, and then we refer to the React component. So this React component is coming from the React library, and then we can just use what, when we do this, then we can use the, all the functions available in the React component. All right? So next is the lab and cons. So, Normally in JavaScript we have these three type of uh, variables. So in the basic case is like we normally use these variables and occupation, and then there's a lab and there's a, and then there's a constant variable as well. So what is the rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is like in variable normally is declared globally, meaning that as long as it's the same file, then anyone can access the variable. But in for constant is more locally, meaning that. Uh, it's only declared inside the functions and then it cannot be used globally. And of course, constant cannot be changed. And then let same as well declare locally, but it can be changed. So it's sort of like a mix between variable and constant. So uh, the rule of thumb is always if you can change, I mean, the rule of thumb, I guess the best practice is like we always declare in constant. Only if like maybe move uh, after you code a few few functions, you realize that you might need to change the that particular variables. Then only really you change the lab. So always start with constant first. Then if you need to change the variable move in maybe by your script, then only you change the lab. All right. So in React itself, uh, normally we do is this way. We declare a constant in here, and then we can render in here. All right. Arrow function. So. This is the typical uh, JavaScript function that everyone understand. So this is a text function, and then there's probably some something that you're gonna do in here, and then this is the arrow function. So the way arrow function work right is is pretty much um, you can say like the lazy way of writing codes, and also the fastest way of writing codes. Huh? So this one and this one is actually the same. The only difference is like you notice. Oh, okay. You don't have to write the whole function up. Then you just pretty much just return this, and then it is done. Of course, there is a lot more uh, for the arrow function, but the way you think it is like the, uh, my my thought about JavaScript developer right is like oh, uh, we are a bunch of lazy people. Like and we want to, we try to write the code as short as possible, right? We don't like to write a lot of repeat things. So that's why that, I guess this is why that we invented the whole arrow function thing. We make things a lot more simple and then uh, a lot more easy to type it out and then we can complete our work much more faster. But to people that is not from JavaScript background, then they will say that what the heck is this, right? So 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 I'm telling you right, this thing and this thing is actually the same thing. It's just a shortened short version, right? So 
there's a lot of ways of do use error function. Like for example, if you go to pass variable here, then you can you can get the variable from the from when you pass it in here and then here. Okay, you can even do it this way. So this and this are pretty much the same thing, right? And of course, uh, if you test it out, then you can get uh, this this you can do it this way. So this is the quickest way. Alright, we just simply type it out and then when, when you call this function, it should you return this string. Alright? So in React, uh, normally we use it on, uh, I mean, arrow function has, it's like something, it's a, one of the main things in React. It's all, it uses all, in almost all the codes, right? So here is what, how we use it. This is the uh, React function, and then this is our class function in React. So basically, it's, it's the same thing. Then, uh, the structuring assignment. So here is, is another uh, JavaScript basics. So if let's say that I have these variables, right? These are object variables. We have the first name, last name, and then we have developer true, and then we have age. Then, we can actually do it this way. So instead of like, we do like developer dot first name, developer dot last name, we can actually write this way. Then we can straight away access the first name variable, and the last name variable, and the developer variable as well. So you don't have to like uh, write multiple dots to just get a, a particular chart of that object variables, right? So this is the structuring assignment. Then you can even do something like this, right? This is an array, right? <coughs> array itself, they have about two, three, four, five in, in the array. And here, you can actually convert the number into a string. So this one will equal to 1. This 2 will equal to 2. Of course, if you declare 3, 4, 5, then you will follow suit. Alright? So, like for example, 1, 2, 4. So, 1, 2, 4. Then, in React itself, uh, we use this a lot because of the, the state that we have in React. So, normally, we just declare this way so that we can use whatever variable or variable in this object state. Alright? And yeah, there's a different, different way of using uh, the structuring assignment. So okay, this one is really interesting. So you can even do it this way, so that you, when you pass in an object, only a certain part of object can be used in that function, right? So next is uh, map and filtering. So we normally we have a list of items in the array, then we probably have an object, multiple objects in that array. So in a map, then we can actually render out whatever here into our HTML markup, right? For filter, we can filter out the list in array, and then we can map it out. Then EXX module, uh, for EXX module, right, it's the way we import file. So in React, we can actually do it this way. So this, this one is actually coming from our work module. Our library, but of course we can use it for our own code as well. Then we can use uh, export default to export the whole thing of our own our, our class into another part using export default. So this is a module system. All right. So the way it works is like let's say I have uh, this function four times and then plus two. These two functions, I can I can put it in one file for uh, one utility file, and then in another file. I can use this to import it out of the function, okay? So, um, there's this book called uh, You Don't Know JS, How I'm Doing. So this book is uh, the pub it's published by Rary, but uh, the publisher, the, the, the author actually give it in free in GitHub. So here's a link to GitHub. I'll, if, you, if you need a basic of JavaScript, I will suggest you to read this book. There are six series in total, and they, uh, the author actually describe JavaScript in very details and very easy to understand, right? So next, level two. Um, of course, level two is uh, the fundamental of React. So the first thing that we have to learn is we have to know what is Create React app. Because uh, with, this, with this Create React app, we can actually uh, launch a React, React application really fast. Then we will want to learn what is the XX, and then we want to learn what is the approx, condition rendering, and component cycle. Okay, so this is the basic. Of course, there are more, but this is the basic. So, create a React app. Um, with this create a React app, right, we can straight away generate whatever file that we need for React. 
So if you if you use MPX uh, create React app and then follow by your your app name, then the MPM will straight away create a folder that is ready for React application. All right. So I'll show you a video on how to use create React app. which allows you to quickly create and run a React application with no configuration. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Before we start, we need to verify what version of Node and NPM we have installed. We can do this on the command line by typing node-v and npm-v. You'll need at least Node version 6 or above on your dev machine in order for Create React App to work. Since we are using NPM version 5.2 or above, we could utilize the MPX package runner instead of having to install Create React App globally. So, to create our app, we'll run MPX Create React App Playground. That'll create a new Playground React App and start to install all the dependencies that it needs to run, build, etc. Now let's change directories to our new app, and from there we can execute npm run in order to see all the scripts that are available to us. We have start, test, build, and inject script. Let's quickly go through these scripts, beginning with npm start. This will kick off a development server for our app and launch a browser instance to the correct URL. Let's take a look at the code that create React app generated for us. In the source folder, there are a few files. The index.js file is where our app begins. You can see the React DOM render where it attaches to the root DOM element. The app.js file contains the app React component. You can see the header that contains the image we saw, and also the intro text. When we open the package.json file, you may be shocked at what you see. Where are all the dependencies? How refreshing that there are only three. React, React DOM, and React Scripts. The React Scripts dependency manages all of the other dependencies, such as Babel, Webpack, Jest, Linting, etc. You can also see that the NPM scripts are just then proxies for functionality inside of React Scripts. Let's switch gears and run the tests with npm test. Under the covers, React uses the just test runner, which is a really nice tool. In our case, there is only one test, but you are encouraged to write your own tests when you start building your app. Now, let's run build script. This will create a production build of your app, and the output results go to the build folder. Once it's done, we can go into the build folder and kick up a simple HTTP server with npx serve. And then we can head over to our browser and take a look at a built version of our React app. Now let's do something fun. Let's install an older version of React scripts to show the experience of upgrading when there's a newer version. In this case, we'll install version 0.9.0. If we come into VS Code, you'll notice something interesting when you hover over one of your dependencies. VS Code actually shows you what the latest version of that dependency is. If you do use VS Code, you can go one step further and install an extension called version lens. Once installed, this extension adds metadata to your package.json dependency. You'll notice that version lens says that we are using the latest versions of React and React DOM, but for React scripts, on the left, it says based on our version range, it satisfies up to version 0.9.5. However, the latest version is 1.1.0. If we wanted, we could click on one of these links to update the package.json file. Or, if you prefer the command line, there are some techniques we could use there, too. First, let's run npm view react scripts versions. This will list out all the versions that have been published to npm. However, if you just want the latest official release, you could try the same command, but remove the s at the end. Another command you could try is npm outdated, which is a native npm command. It'll check the registry for you and see if there are any packages that are currently outdated. In our case, it says React Scripts is out of date. Our version range is requesting 0.9.5, but the latest version is 1.1.0. This is a great command. However, it's read-only. If you want a more interactive update tool, you can try out npm check with the dash u flag. This shows that we have one update, and it's a potentially breaking change since it's now 1.1.0. I'll go ahead and press the spacebar to select and enter to install. The last script is the eject script. If the application that was generated by Create React App doesn't quite fit your needs, 
then you can use the eject script, which will export all of Create React App's dependencies, configurations, and scripts, and inject them into your app. Now this is permanent. There'll no longer be a quick and easy way to upgrade your app if Facebook makes a new version of React Script. Now that we know the risks, let's say it. As I mentioned before, you can see a whole bunch of dependencies, scripts, and configurations were injected into our app. Now we can see some things that we did not see before. There's a config folder that contains stuff for Jest, polyfills, and various webpack configurations. And now we have a scripts folder that contains code for our build, start, and test script. And the package JSON file is much larger than it used to be. And you'll notice that there are many dependencies that could possibly use updating. The React Scripts dependency used to take responsibility of keeping those up to date and compatible, but now that's your responsibility. If we come back over and run npm outdated, you'll see a more concise view of things that may need to be updated. Likewise, you could run npx npm-check-u for an interactive way to update one or more of these dependencies. Thanks for watching this first video in the Create React App series. Stay tuned for more videos to come. So there's a link to the video in here. So if you know, you can actually review it on your own. Okay. So next is uh, GXX. So GXX is uh, okay. If you look at it, right? So the HTML here is actually not the HTML markup that we know. It's actually GXX, all right? GXX is very different than the HTML markup. It's basically, uh, they know there's a video that I want to show you. Uh, I'm going to just show you this video. All right, welcome. In this video, we are going to introduce the exciting topic of JSX. Now, JSX is an extension to JavaScript, which means that it can process things that normally was not part of the syntax of JavaScript, and it will run things behind the scenes. Now, if we come into our JSX starter theme and look in our index.html, we'll see here that we have React and React DOM like we did before, but we've also got Babel. And if you haven't come across it, what Babel does is transpile JavaScript code and rewrite it into something else that other browsers can understand, or that older browsers can understand. So we'll be using Babel quite a bit as we go forward, but eventually it'll kind of become invisible and run in the background through tools. Now, you never want to run Babel like this in production. We're doing it in this case uh, just because we're learning and it makes it simple so that we don't have to have any build tools to write JSX. However, because JSX is an extension to JavaScript and JavaScript itself doesn't know what to do with it, we have to use a tool like Babel to rewrite it into something that does make sense. Now, as we look at these examples here, we're going to talk specifically about what JSX does and what it's doing behind the scenes. So, zoom in, give ourselves a little bit more room here, and we see that we have our script inside of text Babel. This is, again, just for practice settings. As we go on, we won't use this. All right, so now we see a very similar practice exercise. It says, create a PL, which is already created, and use JSX to create a paragraph element with the text, hello React. So if you remember last time, we had to do something like this, right? Is this looking familiar? Cool. Now, with JSX, I'm gonna comment this out. Well, let me leave it out so that we can see it, but I'll have to comment it because uh, it'll break. So, what we can do with JSX is write what looks like normal HTML. Okay, so here's how JSX work. works. JSX will scan your entire JavaScript document looking for a syntax like markup. Okay, so it has within it the ability to parse your entire JavaScript file and look like markup. Now, it's going to distinguish between what is text, remember, because this is a string of text, this is a string of text, this is a string of text, but this is not. So it knows to look for this, and behind the scenes, you know what it's going to do with React? It's going to call create element. It's going to take this value, whatever it is. So if I had a tag, it would take this, pass it into create element, find any children that are going to be between the opening and closing, and it will put them in right here. 
Okay, so this is what JSX is doing behind the scenes. It's allowing us to write what looks like HTML, and then it will parse it and call create element behind the scenes for us to create the exact same thing. Okay? So that's JSX. Now, some people really don't like it, and it takes a while to get used to, but most people, once they really get comfortable using it, prefer this to another approach. Now, the big downside, folks say, is that then we have our markup in our JavaScript. Yes, React is a user interface library, and it has made the decision, especially in partnering, or not in partnering, but uh, most people use React with JSX, even the official docs are written in JSX. They have decided that, yes, in order to create user interfaces efficiently, we are going to have what looks like markup right there inside of our JavaScript. All right. So that takes us to practice exercise number one. Um, that's all that's going on on the page. If I... Yeah, that's uh, a brief session about JXX. So next is we're going to look at what is states and what is props. So we going back to our the blocking form code again. So here is state. This is state. And then this is props. So what's the difference, right? So let's look at props first. Welcome! In this video, we are going to start learning about props. Props are super important in React because they are the fundamental way in which information gets passed from one component down into another. Remember, we have a one-way data flow in React, so components get data and then they pass it down. They don't pass it up. Okay, all that will begin to make sense as we dig into this. We're inside of our props folder inside of starter. And Always keep forward. One, practice two, practice three, etc. So these are other components that I have already set up for you. So if we come down into practice one, for instance, we'll see that here's this functional component set up, and at the very bottom, we export it out. There's more going on, and we'll dig into that in a moment. Um, but practice two, you can see this is also a component, and it gets exported down at the bottom. And what we will do to work with these is we will just uncomment one of them, and then copy and paste that right here as a component call. All right, so now we're beginning to see how we can get different components broken up into different files into here. So we're in practice one. Let's go ahead and check to make sure we've got that. Now we can run npm start. And that will, of course, go ahead and open up our server for us. Let's give ourselves some more room to look at all of this. And you might see some warnings here that certain things aren't being assigned and used. React is very specific about enforcing that if you're not going to use something, then don't import it, which is why we have these other practice exercises commented out. So let's come into practice exercise one and look at what it is we actually have to do here. Okay, so we have two components on the page. This isn't common, and later on I will talk about breaking components up into other pages, which makes a lot more sense. However, for now, learning purposes, this is going to be okay. So we've got one component here that has some information. Like, let's imagine it does an API call or gets that data passed into it somehow, and it gets a username and an ID. However, our user component that actually has the styling for everything and how a user should appear is going to be a separate function. So how do we get data from this into this? Now remember, components that we have looked at so far are all functions. So we could potentially do something like this with JavaScript. Now remember, we're in JSX, so to execute JavaScript, we have to do this. We could take ID and username, pass it in as parameters, right? That should not look crazy. That is just normal, vanilla JavaScript right there. However, in the JSFX syntax, the way we're going to do that is we're going to pass it like this. OK? So what we have here is we're telling username, hey, you're about to get a property or a parameter of ID, and it's going to have the value of this. Now, we can hard code one in, but remember, if we want to use JavaScript in JSX, we have to use the curly braces. So that's why I have ID there. OK? Same thing for username. Hey, we're going to give you something called username, and then we're going to give you a value. Again, this could just be something we hard code here, but uh, we're going to set it up with variables. All right, so what happens now is normally we would, inside of here, get access to ID and username. All right, that's how a normal function would work. React doesn't work that way. 
React will take everything that you pass here as a normal parameter, we are thinking of it like a parameter, and it will attach it to props. So inside of here, notice that I already have this set up, we have props username and props ID. This is props in React. This could have been anything, so we could have called this some random storage value. Notice that our code still works. I've never tried this in production. I don't think you should change the names of props. Uh, this is how all the React uh, refers to it and how it is standard. But basically what's happening is they're just taking parameters, values that you pass into the function, and attaching all of them onto props. The other nice thing is that if we console log out props, I don't know if it will be in this case. Yeah, right now we're only getting a few things, but later on and in other applications, you may be getting a ton of different stuff in props that you might not even um, know is there because it might not be referenced um, in here. It might just have extra data being passed in. Okay, but that is props, and notice that it goes one way. We have practice one, and it gets passed into user. Now, we could in this example, this user just could have been right here and it wouldn't have needed to have been a whole other component. But this also points out something which is in React and in component architecture, you want to break your apps up into really small little niche pieces of functionality, literally just functions, that return a small part of this. So imagine a user would normally have an avatar and a bunch of other things, but that code, and we'll look at later, can be stored in another file and kept off so that it can just be kind of agnostic on its own. That's component architecture. And this is how we pass IDs around. Now you might ask, how do we pass practice up into something higher? Or I'm sorry, how do we, how do we pass ID or username into something higher? And the short answer is, as we're learning the basic flow of data in React, we don't. Okay, there are conventions to get around that, but in general, we set data at one level and pass it down. So if practice one needs to get data, it would need to be called at a higher level component. Now this is the highest one we have, so it's being called here and passed down this way. All this will continue to make sense as we go along. Let's keep playing with some different exercises to get more comfortable with props and how. All right, this is props. Next, um, you're going to look at what is state. Welcome! Over the next couple of videos, we are going to see is that rather than having a functional component like we've had in the past, so if I come back into my prop section and look at one of these, notice that we have a function, right? It is written with the arrow syntax, but it is a function. Now, when we get into state, especially when we're just starting off, we're going to switch to using classes. And the reason for this is that React, one of the things we haven't looked at in the React library yet, but comes with it, is a component. So React gives us a default component with a whole bunch of methods and abilities attached onto it. For example, using state, updating state, and doing lifecycle hooks, which we will look at. So the most straightforward way for us to get benefits from all the React components, which we haven't been getting when we write our own functions, we manually pass in props, and other than that, it's a normal JavaScript function. So if we want to get access to state and everything that it has built into that, we can just extend the React component. Sometimes you'll also see it written like this, where they get component out on its own. So it just is extend component. That works as well. But uh, we're going to show the long way here, uh, just because we're getting started with it all. Okay, so how do we add state to an object? Well, this is actually pretty easy. We simply create a new property called state, and we can create state in our application. Uh, it says create a username or in our component, mind you. It says username with a property of some username. So I'm just going to add this real quick. And some username. Cool. Okay. So now anywhere in this component, we can have access to state. Now, why is this helpful? Why don't we just set our own variables and do the same thing with something like uh, let username equal to username and update it that way? Well, there are a lot of benefits, more than we'll get into at this moment, for using state application. But one of the most Important to know is that when we update our state and then pass it around, React will do a lot of keeping track of stuff. And in general, it's a good idea with large applications not just to have a bunch of variables, but have an actual state object that is your source of truth for all your data, so you always know it's going to go there. So to use state, since this is just a normal JavaScript class, so there's nothing unique about this particularly, we can just call, we got to switch to JavaScript, right, so we do curly braces, this, which refers to this component, which is extending this component. So this.state, 
which is this, this, and then the specific thing we want. User. This is all vanilla JavaScript, by the way, okay? This is nothing React about this. So if we run this and then I get my stuff up and running here, we can see that we have some user name, okay? So that is our data. Now, I want to point out that we're able to do this because of class fields in JavaScript, but this is not fully supported yet in all cases, depending on when you watch this. So you might see this in some other React code. So let me just show you. They would use a constructor function, which is part of classes of JavaScript, pass props into that, and then call super with props. And what that allows you to do is use this inside of here. So without running this constructor function, normally that would not work. And then we could do this dot state and set up our username and some username. Okay, so even in some of the React docs, you will see this. However, class fields, even though it's not fully rolled out, it is supported by create React app. So I think if we were to just look at both of these for a second, this one is much simpler than this, right? I think so. So I'm going to recommend not using this and just know that if you're in create React app, you're fine. And if you have Babel and class fields supported, then you're good to go, which we do in this instance. So that is how we would set up state. Now what we have to learn about next is how do we go about updating state because there is a special function called set state that we call and we never ever want to just call this.state.username and override it directly. So we'll look at that in the next one, but just to review real quick, the important thing here is that we are extending the React component which gives us access to a whole bunch of tools including the ability to update and manage state in a component. And then to create state, we're just writing plain vanilla JavaScript with our whatever it is that we want and then this.state which means practice state and then whatever property of state in order to display it. So this is all plain vanilla JavaScript. We haven't even looked at anything that's specific to React yet, but we're about to when we get into set state and how to do that in the next video. All right, so there's state. So, yeah. Like what uh, the video mentioned, the set state. So here is an example of set state whereby this is your state. So whenever someone type here, you can actually uh, set the new variable in here, and then you can actually use it in here. So this is how the set state works. So next, uh, we are going to look at condition rendering. Condition rendering is is very simple. So if you look at here, it's just that when there's a user data in here, then I'll render home. If there's no, then I'll just render uh, form. So this is called condition rendering. Next, we'll look at component cycle. Welcome. In this video, we're going to introduce an interesting topic called the component life cycle in React. Now the component life cycle is a set of hooks for when certain events take place. Certain events that this component goes through. Now we have created components, we've added components to a page, but we haven't really gotten into the complexity of the data flow through components and when they get updated and all of the different ways that we could hook into it. Now in its essence, hooks are just functions that we're able to call and manipulate the flow of data within a component. So there are a bunch of these hooks and they take place at different times. So what we're going to do now is take a look at these hooks and when they get called. Now keep in mind some of these are more common to use than others, but we're going to take a look at all of them just so we understand fully what's going on. Okay, so what we see here is an illustrated view of the different functions that we have that are hooks within the component lifecycle. And they break down into four stages. We have our initializing stage, which is before the component is loaded to the page, but we do have some information about it. Then we have the mounting stage, once the components are actually loaded to the page and they are there landed. Now they stay in this state until anything is updated. Now remember, if any props are passed into this component and any state above it is passed in as props at any level, then this component will get updated. So if that is the case, we come down into our updating phase, and there are a number of different hooks here that we will look at, particularly things like, hey, should we update this component? We have complete control based on what changes have happened. And we've seen render a bunch, so that should look familiar. 
components get re-rendered, we'd actually have already seen that in action. But we have some other hooks like, hey, did this component get updated, and uh, should we do anything about that? And finally, we come down to the unmounting phase, which is not most common to hook into, but is really important in certain use cases that we might want to clean up after our component, depending on what's going on. So this is the component life cycle, and we can see it sort of illustrated here, and this may be helpful to you, but in essence, these are just a bunch of functions that we can call to manipulate what's going on with our component and tap in at different times. Now we can also... Okay, so this is the uh, life, component life cycle. I'm not going to uh, let the video finish because uh, you can be on this back at home. So next is uh, level 3. Level 3 is we have to learn about what is router. Okay, so in most of the website we have like multiple links, multiple pages. So how we navigate from one page to another page. So we use we use React Router to do that. And like for example, we have home, we have users, we have contact. So how we gonna link all these three together, right? So we use we use router to do that. So here we just declare our route. Like here, this is for home page, and then we have like uh, slash users for user page, and then slash contact for contact page. So this topic is really important, and it's really you, have, you can really go very deep on our uh, real router. So uh, wait. okay. So this is uh, real router beginner guys. So hopefully you can read this back at home. So we explain a lot more than I'm, I'm just I'm just explaining the basics. So here they have covered a lot of different different kind of topics related to the React routers. Then uh, uh, level four it's uh, Redux. So um, we have another speaker that going to talk about Redux later on. So here I just go to the basics of what Redux is. Today we're going to talk about Redux. Yep, Redux by itself. React and Redux are very good matches when they work together. But only by understanding them individually, we can work them together even better. So, what does Redux do? Let's find out. In real life, we have so many things to do, like feeding the cat, picking up children, and cooking. And it becomes harder and harder to remember all of them in our head. What if we have a notebook that holds all the information so that we never forget? Whenever something comes up, we write it into the notebook, and that solves all our troubles. Same with the web page. A web page can do all sorts of things, like buying tickets or loading hotels. To manage all those functionalities, it uses Redux to keep track of important data. Sounds pretty cool, right? But hold on, is that all in this? There's something between initiating the action and actually writing something onto the notebook, or say Redux. Let's try to find that answer by recalling our own thinking process before we write into a note. Let's imagine a room with a washing machine. It's a Sunday afternoon, and we're doing our laundry in a public laundry room. So that means we need to get back on time before laundry finishes. There are three steps before we write something into our notebook. The first step is to put in the clothes and press the start button. The second step is to read how many time does it need for the public washing machine to finish the job. The third step is to add the current time and the washing machine wait time and finally write down the finish reminder on that notebook. Now let's review the three steps that we just talked about. The three steps are step one, starting the machine. Step two, reading the time left on the washing machine. Step three, do the math in our own head by adding washing machine time with current time. 
and finally get the finish time to write onto the notebook. Great. Now we know what we should do to convert our real life action into data. Let's see how Redux do this in the exact same way with slightly weirder names and terms. For the first step, where we perform a behavior of starting a machine, it is technically not within the Redux cycle. But most of the time, you need something to trigger the Redux to start running. For the second step, where we read the wait time from the screen of the washing machine, Redux call it dispatch. Dispatch in English means to send or to convey. Dispatch conveys information from real life into our reducer for calculation. By the way, that information that got us dispatched is called an action. We'll, we'll talk about it later. For the third step, where we added current time with the machine time in our head, Redux call it a reducer. So reducer handles the calculation to get the end time of the washing machine. Finally, the washing machine end time that we write into the notebook is called state by Redux. So state is basically important and dynamic data. In real life, we call that a note, and Redux calls it a state. Whenever we need to look at the recorded end time, we ask for the state, just like how we look at the notebook. Now that we have became familiar with the concept, I'm going to introduce some basic syntax to you. In Diamond Code, we help explaining concepts on a higher level to help people decide what they are going to dive into in the future. This part is to prepare people with relative coding background to dive and code immediately. So if you're not sure what we're talking about just yet, you get there soon as long as you dive into relative coding experiences first. By pressing the washing machine start button, it's the same as grabbing an HTML button element and let it trigger a Redux dispatch process. The dispatch process reads whatever is on the washing machine meter and sends it through a JavaScript object. Redux calls that object an action. This code is sort of hard coded because we literally put one and a half hour in the action value key value pair. In order to solve that, we can pass it in through the dispatch function. We call the variable time and use the time in the action value. Let's look at the reducer. Reducer has two jobs. It initiates the state, and it changes the state according to the actions it receives from dispatch. What is state again? It is dynamic and important data that Redux try to manage. It's like a notebook in real life. In this code, we have two cases of starting the machine and stopping the machine. These will potentially change the state when relative actions are dispatched into the reducer. By saying, do something with the state in this code, we're doing things like setting the state end time value to no, or set it to a certain time. Finally, when the program asks for the state, like how we ask for data on a notebook, we call store.getState.laundry. Laundry is a key that represents one reducer but in real programming, there can be as much reducers as we want. After writing all those reducers, like laundry, grocery, go to work, etc., etc., we can wrap them all up using combined reducers, just like the first line of the code. Now that we have explained the concept of Redux using washing machine and briefly introduced the syntax, are you ready to guide the code? So this is the basic of Redux. So once you learn uh, basic of JavaScript, React, React Router, React Redux, next thing is uh, the advanced level. You can learn about higher order components, React code, and style component. Right? So higher order, higher order components is uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm not even going to show this video to you because uh, we sort of like overtime right now. So you can view this video at home later on. So there are like three parts of it, and this is actually a really good video to explain what is higher order components. So this is part one, then part sorry part two, and then part three. All right.
So next is the React Hook. So React Hook is something that relatively new. They introduced on, uh, I think, uh, version version 16.9. So React Hook is it's sort of like we convert the traditional uh, React class component class back to functions. All right. So if you look at it, right, the left one it's a bit long, and then the right one is a bit short. So it go back to the fundamental of how uh, Java, Java, JavaScript developer works. It's like we try to minimize as many code as possible, right? We try to write as few code as possible, right? So this is the classic example of why we create something else and then we think it's too awesome, then we create another something else, all right? So this is basically how, well, how JavaScript works. And there's a mini crash course about React codes that is, I think is really good, so you can go here as well. And then the last thing is sound component. Um, again, the next speaker will talk about sound component. So I'm only going to go a little bit brief about sound component. So what sound component do is here. You notice that this is CSS, right? And then there's a component here. So we have a component of sound button. And then there's a component in here that we use sound button. And then we basically attach CSS elements into the component itself. So you don't have to write a separate CSS file anymore, you can just write it here. Of course, of course this is just the basic, there's a lot more details about start component, right? So let's recap of our roadmap. So the first thing is, of course, you need to learn uh, HTML and CSS. Then you have to learn some basic JavaScript. Then the fundamental React. Then React Router. Redux, then the advanced stuff like higher order components, the sound components, and of course React hooks. So, so if you are new to React, so this is basically the framework that, uh, the roadmap that you can follow. Of course, there's a lot more. Like for example, even the basic stuff, there's a lot more things. But with this alone, you pretty much can get your app started. And then as you build uh, your app, then you can learn more things about React. Okay. So uh, here's the resources that I use for this presentation. So you notice that a lot of them are actually from DevTalk 2. So this website, right, there's a lot of uh, really, I think it's a really good articles that you can learn from, especially that most of the writers here are developers themselves. So uh, it's much more easy to understand, right? So here's uh, some links you can, you can go to one by one to learn more about uh, the other topics. So this is pretty much uh, my presentation for today. So uh, don't remember to join the group if you want to get a slide. All right, so any question? So, uh, so what you mean is like how I write the code? Did I, did I follow all the standards around the coding community? So personally, right, I mean, back about probably early of this year, I never actually follow any coding standard at all. I, because me myself is a freelance developer, so most of my code I develop for my clients. Only I'm the one. I'm the one. The one only developers. So a lot of time I didn't follow any guideline at all. But uh, recently, um, I I try to use React React to actually create create the React application because in the past I always use Webpack and then write my own Webpack script and then start from there. So pretty much my own monoplane instead of using the official one. And then recently that I started to move towards create React app, I feel that like it's much more easy to use to create React app compared to if you want to like compile your own monoplane. I mean you can do that, but it's just that unless you understand a certain component like what is Webpack do, how do you minimize, minimize scripts, and how, the, how does Webpack works, then I think uh, you follow the Create React app is much more a better way. And then uh, even in the Create React app itself, they have a lot of uh, ESLint, then they can actually tell you like, okay, you should do this and you shouldn't do that. So a lot of times in the past, I never actually thought about that, but once I go to that direction, then I realized that, oh, there's actually a lot of standards that you have to follow, which is a good thing. I mean, uh, it actually makes your code much more clean, and then for others to understand, especially if you work in a team, then you have to write a clean code. Me, myself, because I'm a, I'm a one-man band, so sometimes I don't really 
think about the need of writing a clean code, but right now I should move into that direction as well. So I think it's really important to write clean codes. Right? Did I answer the question? Okay, any more questions? We have T-shirt to give one. Okay, you mean about the bootstrap framework, right? Yes. So, okay, so bootstrap is a, a totally separate framework. It's a web framework for uh, designing, and then they make things a lot things easy. But um, React itself, it's sort of like you build on top of that. So you use bootstrap together with React. So it saves you a lot of work. I don't think I answered the question. So can you maybe tell me again what was your what what, what you want to know? Okay, because I see some that is you mentioned one is pure bootstrap as a bootstrap and then it combines in memory. Yeah. But yeah, I see some as in it's a bootstrap but it uses React instead of memory. Okay, okay, okay. I think I understand what you mean. So okay, rule of thumb, if you use React, don't use jQuery. It doesn't work. Those two things doesn't work. So if you want to use bootstrap, you have to use the React version of bootstrap. So we have version of Bootstrap, they, um, maybe there's a jQuery, I didn't look at the, the, the library code because me myself, I don't use Bootstrap. So, but if you want to use that, make sure you use the React version of Bootstrap because it's going to be different uh, with the, the, the much more known uh, Bootstrap frameworks. Because much more known Bootstrap frameworks, they use jQuery and then in React, we uh, behave differently. Like, for example, like, like, like when you click a button, right? In, in jQuery, normally we just listen like a button and then we listen for a click, right? But in React, it doesn't work that way. Because React, we sh there's only a listener there. We just do like a click in the component and then straight away, we can trigger something else. So, so if you look at that, right? So it doesn't, it, it, you cannot use React and jQuery together. It's not supposed to be that. There are some people that use it, use it together, but I don't think that's a, that's a best practice. Huh? So you should, should, you should separate that out. So if you want to use any framework that is not related to React, make sure it's compatible with React. So like for example, um, maybe you try to do uh, you try to do uh, a form, like you, you need to create a form or something, then maybe you try you find some some form library in, in JavaScript. So make sure that you find the one that is that has been wrapped with React and don't use the pure JavaScript version because it might not work for in React. So make sure you find another one that normally is like in like in Bootstrap, like right? it will have like okay React for Bootstrap, a big Bootstrap for React sort of things. So you look for that but library. Don't use the original version because it might not work. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Right? Any more question? No? Which one you want? Sticker? T-shirt? You think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's all from my talks today. Um, if you have, you guys don't have any questions, then we will ask the, set, the next present, uh, presenter to present this talk. Okay. All right?
uh, but in different way which work better we will react. So I'm, I'm basically I already have a, a React project <coughs> set up. So I'm just going to run through the basic. Okay, um, basically everything is like simple. Um, if if you are really beginner to the React, you don't understand that. Um, I'm really sorry about this because yeah, it's pretty pretty much for like um, at least you have a basic knowledge about the React. So um, everything will be is kick off with the app component. We have I have a app component here. And then I have a, I already created like two basic components which is container and button. So uh, if I go to the container, <coughs> it basically is like I it will it will just like the a div with your class name with CSS component. So if I show you the CSS code this one. So basically what it does is whatever things I put inside the container, it will set the things in the center. So yes, in the center. So a lot of people is, uh, is really, really difficult to do this. Yeah, I mean, a um, few years back, if you want to do something like this, it's really difficult to center everything in the center. So um, basically just using flags, you can just research about it or whatever. Yeah. And another thing will be a button. I specifically that style of things that I have another component button and then have a class name. And the CSS will be something like just a set of thing. I start a component and when I hover it, it animates something, when I click it or whatever, etc. And one thing to mention is I did like try to animate a box shadow. I mean this is not a React thing. Even if you try to animate a box shadow in static website by using CSS, it's always not a good thing. Because you you're not going you, you, you might don't want to do something like change the value of the box shadow because you might hurt the performance really badly. So you, you can actually work around by you can search around, they can actually try to like using the opacity to like animate the shadow. You can research about it. Yeah, this is the thing. So um, let me actually uh, start the thing again. Just make sure. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, let's start here. Let's show you this one. So, this, this is the end result. Very simple. The button in the center. So when I hover it, it basically will just scale up and add a shadow at the back. So when you click it, very basic stuff. So when you look at the code, uh, I'm just going to use the button component. It's very simple. You're using the class name, just like what you did for the static website. And by the way, in React, we normally we use class name instead of class because um, yeah, this is it, it just it might conflict with other things, so you don't need to use a class name in React. Okay, so very basic. So um, <clears throat> how about um, I don't know whether you guys have used the Bootstrap. Just mentioned before. Um, normally, how Bootstrap do is um, you want to, for example, this class name, you put BNT, and you start the button into a Bootstrap like button. So how about if you want to have a error button? So you attach another another class called error, something like this. So you can actually do this exactly same in in, in React. I did have a, a things here, the class name. So I'm just going to do a copy and paste it here. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to type. Sorry, sorry, actually. <clears throat> dash, dash. So, uh, thanks for the remark. Okay. So, it will change a little bit, which is pretty standard. But in the React, uh, because everything is using state, everything is using props. So, 
cái sự ảnh hưởng của bộ remove fit for nó một cái phân tích so in react normally how we do thing is that we uh, I have a button here I want it to be error state so we will pass across all the error so actually this is a sharp form of this I want it to be error be true so how I'm going to like modify my component in the way I can actually like do stuff like this in React way okay so how people actually do is um, let me <coughs> so um, this is normal string so when what we start to do is like attach to it but how we would want to make the string dynamically so I so what I will do I will do something like this So, I hope you can understand. So basically, we, by default, we always have a CSS button class. And then we make a condition, if the error is true, then we return the error class name, else we just return the empty strings, which is very basic. So, it will work, because I already passed the error here, so it will show read if I remove the error props, which is back to the, the normal one. Okay, so everything looks fine. So what is the problem here? Um, throughout, throughout the whole development process, right, you might have like multiple state for your for, for this in this case like button. You have an error state. Maybe in future you want to include another warning state. So um, you, you might think, okay, I'm just I'm just going to add another thing at the back. Um, but it it will make your code looks really bad because. If you don't do stuff like it's 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 not not even readable in this way. Even I only have one conditions here. So what I'm going to show you guys is by using the style components. So basically, style components you do everything in they they call it as a CSS in JavaScript. So you write your CSS inside your JavaScript file instead of like have another extension external CSS file like here. So I'm going to like live code here. So hope it doesn't have any trouble happen. No. So this guy create another. Room. So I so for, for the beginners, so like I'm going to show you how how we actually create components. So we create another class, uh, another file called. I'm just going to make it like a style button. So, so what I'm going to do is 
Basically here is like we creating a button and we want to include this style, this style in CSS style. And then after we have the components, of course we need the X1 now. So we can use it after this.
Thing. Nowadays, when we're using the app and a website, so we will have something called teaming. So you will have in our website, I'm going to have a primary colors in our website to streamline the entire report, entire this, which means like from text view, from buttons, for the radio buttons, I'm going to use exactly the same color, which is called the primary color. So Supplement did provide a, a, a good way to actually make your all, all your all your sign is actually the same color or even a variable. So um, I did have a config here which I already defined the primary colors I'm going to use it which is magenta same as the, the other button I just showed you and an arrow color and a gray. Okay so I'm going to do something to like make it now it's pretty much a hard coded for button for let's say if I have like text view uh, whatever, a lot of components. I hard coded the color in this way. So we might have a problem when we want to change the color. We, I have to manually, individually, uh, for each component, I have to manually change the color here, which is bad. So that's why we have the config file here, and we're going to use this to uh, make the make, 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 make the color to be the same as so. So what I'm going to do is it and. I'm going to do is uh, import another component call. Import. So that's the component call uh, being provided, which actually provides to you your team config to the entire app. So normally, when you see the a lot of library actually using the provider as a component name, which basically what you should do is um, you should grab everything into, into the shell. So in this case, like team provider. Okay. So this team provider actually has a thing to uh, see props. So you need to pass in our props, our team config into this prop. So because I already have this file, so basically I'm just going to import that file here. I'm going to use the, the user zero code actually having an auto importing, so you can type it, you can actually import for me here. So now I already have the theme. <coughs> so, which means in my style button, I can actually access the theme color in this way. So, in, instead of having hard coded color here, I'm just going to do something like of the accessibility color and this is primary the color here. And since I also have a I have a color set so I'm going to change it to this color. This is how you uh, do the shaping for the sound component. Okay, so um, so I was mentioning about it's easy to share component with the sound component library. So I did have a component here which is called a text view, which is actually from one of my projects. 
So it using a subcomponent as well. So you can see I just need one file and then I just going to like drop it into my components and I'm going to use it you now. Um, um, I'm going to hide the button for now and then import the next field. So I didn't include any CS, special CSS. I'm using exactly the same component. So everything just works just fine. And using a theming as well. So <coughs> this is, and I can actually show you the components here. Star components, exactly some star components, and I do some special animation or whatever. So it, it actually throw whatever something here, which is. Yeah, this is this is the benefit of using style components. Okay. Okay. So um, next, I'm going to talk about uh, like uh, how you actually do the animations. So normally for simple animations, we using the event CSS event like the hallway event, the active event, or focus event to animate something. Um, this is very basic. How? What? 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 You want to do some robots animations? Um, that's the thing called the JavaScript animations. So, what is JavaScript animation? So, in traditional CSS animations, you can't do animations like really basic. Like you can't do some uh, bouncing. I, I mean, you can actually do it, but it just doesn't really look so basic enough. You, know, you can actually include some velocities or whatever. So. Um, so that's that's tons of library which actually animates by using JavaScript. So one of it is the pop motions. So pop motion is actually provides a lot of animation library that you can use. You can see there's like five animations, which some of them you can use it for uh, animate the SVG, SVG items by changing from here to here and whatever. And there's another called Pure, which is really advanced animation function for you to animate things by using JavaScript. So the, the one that I'm going to use is actually pop motions. Um, <coughs> if I click it, you can actually see that the animation looks nice, right? It's much more bouncing, spring, and looks realistic, like physics enough. And yeah, you can actually see the code, really basic, really simple. So when, when you actually building an uh, applications, right? You, you want to have a robust animation, you want to have a cool animations. So, but you just a normal developers. You, yeah, you have no idea how to create such a robust animations. You, you just want something simple, the library can handle all the things for you. And yeah, this is the library for you, for you to use it. And the, the syntax is actually very sim similar to star components, which is like pose and then beat or button or whatever. So I'm, I'm going to like, uh, normally you, you, you don't want to like do the hover, do the hover animation, but uh, let me switch back to the, switch back to button. So you hover it, it grows, and then have a shadow, and you move it, you just go back. It's just a simple animation. Normally you, you, you don't want to use a JavaScript to style this kind of animation, because it just, this does is, Simple animations and using JavaScript animations, some uh, you, you might uh, cause some performance issue as well, so you might need to use it wisely. So, for the sake of demos, I'm going to like uh, try and use a post animation style to uh, make it animate. So, because I already installed the package, so I'm going to import it for now.
So I have a post here. So um, basically, how we move it is that uh, first we allocate a, a component for the post first. And you can name it whatever you want as well. So post, and then just a start component of what are the things you want to create. I want to, in this case, I want to create a button. I create a button. So, and then we just, this is not a user event. So it's simply using the, uh, the button, the normal button, and the button of the config here. So, okay, because I want to make my button how it looks. So, uh, post library actually has a, a, a thing is called the uncoverable, to make it true. So basically, now this button will listen to hover events and then do the hover, uh, do the hover animation that we define here. But now I'm going to define the animation. So first, without any hover or whatever, the init, initial animation, what I'm going to do here. So um, I'm just going to copy the code here. The whole CSS animation. And because it doesn't use the uh, CSS, it may be still. So normally in Java, we use the template. The animation here. And JavaScript again. This is the animate with the post command, but uh, you will see it will be it's like it's a bit slow one. Um, this is one uh, one thing when using post is to try not to use tra transitions and also in Java and in CSS try not to use all at all costs because you might make something weird and then you like scratch your head to say that like, what 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 the heck the animation is going weird or whatever. So in this case, I'm just going to like. Because the transitions will actually affect the, the duration of the animations. And you can see. So I don't know whether you can you can you can notice the animation is actually much more physic, much more powerful here. Yeah, I will. So this is how we actually do the do the uh, animation by using the post. Everything it, it, it actually powered by the JavaScript. And 
also it is also like do things like is it a uh, if uh, if you if you press it if you want to do that event there's another thing called pressable and then it goes through and then you have another step called press and you, you you can name it you can actually find find the documentation on their website which is I, I think it's really really good documented so they have things like uh, UI events you have like Harvard Open Express or whatever then you can actually like them on it this is the animation it's almost similar to mine but for some reason it's great but yeah this is actually drag you can do the drag and drop here not drag and drop like drag drag and around and this is the event what's the position and yeah and giving up an animation like this is just like you you may think I I could just do it in CSS then because it just listen to the events like hover position click or whatever. Um, one 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 of the one of the props one 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 of one of the benefit of using post animation is that it much more state focused because when you're writing a React app, basically everything is state. So in React, how we do animation is that when the state changes. Based on the state, I want to animate something. So, it's it's not necessary to have like a really predefined state. Like, how we can actually have state. Like, I want to have another state called A, or like, and then another state called B. So, because I only have a a snippet here, which I don't want to type all the things. Um, but I was still want to run it. Um. So, like I mentioned, you have can have another um, config property called the pressable, and then you just when I press it, I want to animate differently, and I have another two state called A and B. So, um, but it do nothing now because I already included the pressable. So when I hover, I click, it will have another different animation. How about the A and B? So I want to do something crazy. Uh, I have another code. Um, let me import that code. But it's just you, you just you just think as the, the whole thing is just doing one thing. I'm going to explain what it actually do. So we have uh, variables here. It's toggle, so it will be true or false. So the entire things will be when it will keep on toggling the the, the variables. In this case, it's actually prop. Uh, it's actually state toggling the state into true and false for every five hundred milliseconds. So. Um, because I already define uh, A and B's different anima animation state here, so so how do I use it? So when the state changes, I want it to be from A to B or B to A. So you can actually do something like this: passing the the props, call the post, and then using the is toggle. <coughs> is toggle is get it true, then you just so the end result will be for 500 milliseconds it will just like back and forth for some reason it's great Basically, that's my my something state in this code. So basically, the idea is that for five hundred milliseconds, the state will change from true to false, from false to true. So it will keep on like changing the state to be animated. So if it's is true, it will animate uh, animate to the right, and if it's false, it will animate to the left. Something like this. So it actually listens to the state changes and animates to the animation you want. 
Okay, so let's make it much more interesting. Um, what it normally we will we will have what what an animation we can apply to uh, pop up dialogue things. So I have a component here. It's called model, which act, which will actually uh, shows a, a dialog box in front. So I'm just going to import it into my app. So. So um, why am I using this one? Um, basically, this is one of the React features which is called Fragment. So when you use it, so whenever you want to have another component side by side with this component, and and it will start comparing because some component components like Team Provider they only accepting one um, one shell at a time. So if if I I will remove this fragment, you will see they actually have two components which is Yes, so I mean, I know, which will draw an error. So one uh, one of the old solution is actually you wrap it with a diff like this, which is actually like one component now. But the diff will actually render on your website, which you don't want it to actually render on your website. You just, you want to be like I just want two components. I don't want to have another like, extra elements to wrap around your uh, components. That's why we use the fragment. So it actually rendered these two without actually render another wrapper around. Okay. So I will show you. If I save it correctly. Okay. Okay. The model is actually accepting the cross also. Now I need to show to show pops uh dialog box here. So so I want to do something like that. if I click the button I want it to show it. So um I'm doing I'm actually creating a state. Open is actually box, which means it won't show the uh, the, the things here. So yeah, it won't show it. So when I click the button, I want it to show. So basic thing, we are just going to create another event. Um, this might look a bit complex, but um, basically I just to show you. So when the things enter, I'm going to scale up, and when 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 things is is invisible, everything will be scale will be zero, opacity will be zero, and everything is hidden. And when you enter enter the page, you I'm, I I want you to scale it to one, and the opacity is one, so it will be visible, and we can actually customize the animation and the keyframes to be. Using the screen animations, so it will be like a bit bouncing when it show up, and then 
you can actually delay the things. Actually having two two things here. One is overlay, overlay is a like background. So you can see that the background is actually a bit darker. I call it overlay. And this is a cut. So um, I have two different components and then at the end I actually like combine to one thing. Okay? So this now I actually passing the this shows right. So this thing, so if it is true, then you render this thing, which you render the overlay and cut, and it solves you just show my thing. But writing code like this, it will just snapping the components without any animations. So how am I going to use it? Um, I, I already have a state enter and exit for both overlay and cut. So we can technically do something like just I mentioned before using the post and then do some crazy logic here and then change it. But uh, that's another component provided by the props. Uh, the post animation is post group. Okay, so I'm going to wrap everything inside here into a post group. If you want to pass something into the pops group, uh, I mean the, the body of it, it must be an array or a list. In this case, it's actually not an array here. So how we, we, we want to make it into an array. So how we do it is that So basically what the post group do is that uh, whatever something appears or disappears from the from, from inside, it will animate. And the animation will depend on what are the animation we define for each individual items here. So in this case I already have an animation defined for the overlay and card. So let's just see. So if I click, we just have a nice and great animation pop up. And just as I mentioned, there's a spring field. Kind of boxy thing. Something like this. How about exit? Um, I actually have the on click, which when I click the cut, and I want to do something. So let's just do another one last thing here. transition group but that one you need to create another external state as well to animate it or if you want to use that one you can go ahead but 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 if you're using that that library you, you still need to create a CSS class which is really hard to maintain and one of one of the good thing in this one um, and, and the style component is that if I will show you the CSS button so okay you work on a project for quite a long time and you want to make some change to the button. And then your button get getting complex. This this one is still suitable, but in the future you might want to like wrap a lot of things into one com one one button components. And you want to change some style of it. And developers like me like to use features to cook because of the features you can click and add it into another file. But in this case, because the class is actually a string. So I want to know where it's in, I want to browse it. So I have no way to like actually browse the thing. So how you do it? You basically go to the global search and then search a class name and then file the file and click it. A lot of uh, step to do here in order to change stuff. But using style component and post, you basically everything is just in one component class. Uh, I mean one, one component file, which is very easy to maintain and refactor it. And even, even though if I want to change the style button into a different pace, 
it won't break anything because I didn't like import any of your CSS file and if 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 I using a PHP app, that might be a kill. Yeah. For a complex project. So you can actually browse, uh, go go to their website and look at uh, what kind of animation they actually have. They have like um, tons of things. Like I can actually show you some you know, example. Uh, your live groups. So it actually using a post group, which means when something inside the post group change. You will try to animate it. With you know, you think about the JavaScript logic. You just need to define what the animation you want, it, and it's pretty boring. Yeah. So um, basically, this is this is the introduction for the style control and the post animations. So that's it. So do you have any question or to ask? Yeah. I can start. Yeah. Um, so I'm very impressed with your with your pattern, and I want to reuse it in my project. Yeah. But I don't like, for example, the overlay animation. Can uh -huh. I somehow override it? Yeah. How do I like? Oh, that thing. Um, it actually depends on how I actually uh, design the components. In this case, I actually designing the uh, the, the, the dialogue here. So if you don't like the animation, you want to change it, right? So um, that's one way. One way is that I directly copy this file to you, and then you modify the animation here by itself. But normally, it is not people do. In, in imagine this, if this is a library, it's like um, you import it, like how you actually import the stuff from the library. So imagine this is from the library, and you want to customize it. Um, it's really up to the author of the library whether they provide the way for you to customize animations. So, um, I cannot extend and just override it. You, oh, 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 you mean like uh, have a that make it like ex extend it or post or uh, actually, for example, this button. So now, currently, the button for me it's it listen to the hardware the animations. Right? So, if I want to do something, I want to extend the animation. When the page is loaded, I want it to be like do some animation and then show up. You can actually do something like this by creating another post post animation wrapper wrap around the button, so you can actually like animate the buttons. What about removing it? Removing it. Um, so this this is why they provide a, a a a component called a post group, which means whatever inside got removed or rendered, it will based on your Based on the animation you define, and then play the animations like exit, and then I enter the animations. So if you, I I don't know whether I understood your question. So if you say that um, I give the button, uh, I give I give the dialog components to you, you want to extend the animations. It's really up to the author whether they want to provide a a, a props for you to customize the animations. So the short answer is yeah. it's difficult. It's yeah, difficult, but it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. How you deal with such such complex uh, applications? Uh -huh. Do we have uh, a kind of parent component, style component? Yeah. For example, a parent component to define the style of the children. Yeah. With uh, style components, is this? Okay. Um, I can actually play up. This is a good question. So, uh, as just now I showed you the text views, right? This is the text view component. You can see that's a bunch of chunks here. So I have the the, the parents are actually the style components, but I didn't do the style component for the rest of the components inside the child. So why? So basically, the way I define the style component is I I have the style components and then I define a you can you can you can make it as a class here, and in this case, I'm going to be like whatever the label child in this component, you do something. So it is exactly the same. If you if you make this thing as a class, right? So in the label, you can do something like you just in, insert the class name, the name of. Label. 
um, uh, if you're a regular CX swap, previous CX guy, you want to do something like this, you can actually do stuff like this. Okay. So, um, I think we, I actually have a thing. So this is one of the projects that I worked on previously, which using the post animation and the star components. So I think it'll be like all the bouncing and the creeping and danger show. So all this color here is actually using the machine improviser. So it's 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 very easy to make. I think it's very possible and it's easy to maintain. And just now the, the text view that you saw, I actually grabbed it from this project. So without any extra CSS import, I just import the CA and JavaScript code, it just works out of the box. Yeah. So one other yeah. question. For yeah. example, in this thing we have a CSS folder. Yeah. Um, not nothing about React or anything. So it's easy for him to style the command. Yeah, style your components. Oh you mean I uh, you have a universal class to can be applied to different components right? so uh, it's it's really up to uh, different developers so for me for myself I always think that uh, when writing a React app right you want to share the code components by components so um, yeah it's it's real in back in the day when we're building a static website we tend to be like sharing the same sound for even Items, uh, I mean, like like button, text screen, or whatever. But in React, I always think that keep keep everything into one component and share it with the entire component. So, I I, I mean, it, it, you can actually share sharing stuff, but um, normally you are only sharing the like the covers through uh, by using the CSS or the SAS through your entire apps. But if you say that like, you want to share like make the CSS the class to be shareable. Uh, it's really up to you to see whether because star component is not a ne necessary thing for you to actually want to use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to show the uh, show you their website. Uh, show you the their documentation that's the code index. So when uh, let me find the codes here. So okay, for example, uh, we make it grab. So we grab something. So uh, just want to grab. Something. Okay, you drag something and it happens. So I, I want to do something like uh, when I start dragging or when I finish dragging, I want to listen to the events. They actually provide uh, an event listener like uh, drag end and drag start or whatever. You can actually pass in a, a function which is an event to actually do the things that you want to do. Which you can actually get a lot of information there. Yeah. For example, this one. When the drag is end, you do something. When the drag is start, you do something. Yeah. So, no questions? So, yeah. One more. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned SAS and Nathan mentioned SAS. Is SAS a competitor to this or they work together? Uh, they actually work together. I mean, I mean, uh, Basically, SAS is a um, much, for me, it's a, a better version of CSS. So, in CSS, normally you, you, you can only define things like this. So you can't define master CSS here. But SAS, you can actually define things like this one. But in Star Component, they actually, Star Component is actually like using uh, some uh, advantage of SAS. Which you can actually define like in a, define everything into one one class. If you see if you if you if you, if you see this as an entire class, then means that you can actually define something in the middle. But I can't use SAS to inject things inside here. Um. So
so far, I, I, I don't, based on my knowledge, I never do that before. But um, I think you actually can. You can actually can. But, but I kind of I kind of forgot how you actually do it. But I, I actually done it before. Before before the team product actually came out, I actually using the stars to share my colors across the app. So um, it's 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 I remember. I think it's it's something like you you need to pass in something. Like a parameter inside, and then you just make it cross. And if you like, uh, want to access a class in the SAS, you, you can actually kind of access it here. Or something. Yeah. yeah. So, if no question, I'm going to wrap up my thing. So. Thanks for thanks for attending my talk. So I'm going to pass it to the next speaker. Um, SAS and style component are not competitors because style component is an extent of SAS. You have to understand SAS in order to build style component. Otherwise, it will be very confusing. Yes. You can't jump from CSS to style component. You must have from CSS, you learn a little bit from SAS, and then you go to style component. Here's uh, my experience is uh, I was a SAS developer, coming from SAS before converting to uh, style component. So my experience is like, yeah, at the beginning, it's, uh, you know, you used to be like, you have one like, button class, and then you used to have their button class on all the other. You're good, but some, somehow when you convert to start component, you can't do that anymore because it's a different different environment. But it takes some time to get used to it. But once you get used to it, I think uh, start component has a better way of doing things. But because it's much more compatible with React itself, and and for my personal experience, it's like this is probably the thing that I want to move forward to in terms instead of going back to SAS again, right? Okay, so. Um, our next speaker, he said he's going to talk about Redux. So. Yes, Darren. Um, can I get a show of hand if anyone knows about Redux or have used it? <laughs> well, pretty much everyone knows about Redux. That's the first point. Uh, so. Hello. So, for, uh, for those that who don't know Redux, uh, so I'm going to give a bit of introductions and uh, talk about some core uh, concepts about Redux or how it can be helpful for your projects and so on. Um, so uh, my name is Hisin. Uh, I'm a software developer at White Room Digital Agency. Uh, so in White Room, we build uh, custom applications for our clients, uh, including mobile applications, websites, and uh, CRM, etc. Basically, what clients want, we will try to assess it and then build it. Um, uh, in our company, we are a lover for React, uh, including myself. I've been basically using React uh, for all the front-end projects. So I came from uh, the background of uh, jQuery and, and those era when uh, you have a bunch of front-end frameworks for it. Um, so I find uh, I find it ends up with React because I just find it easier. And, uh, and then fast. Uh, so, what what is Redux? Uh, Redux is basically a state container. Uh, it's created by Dan uh, Abramov, uh, which is a guy that uh, you will see him a lot in the React uh, talk. Uh, if you do Google uh, YouTube uh, about uh, React presentation and so on, you will probably see him. So he is this guy here. Uh, smart dude. Um, so Redux is actually inspired by Flux, uh, which is uh, uh, pre uh, presented before uh, Redux. Um, you can actually use Redux uh, without React. So if you have another front end uh, applications you want to build and you have complex states you want to manage, you can actually use Redux. So Redux and React is not really like high coupled together. So, um, so what are the problems that uh, Redux solve? The, the problems uh, that Redux solve is uh, state management. So, uh, let me 
show you a roadmap of this is a, a bit out of topic so uh, let me show that uh, if you want to become a React developer and if you're new to React right this is a roadmap that is showing uh, in 2019 if you want to become a React developer this is uh, these are all things that you need to know which can be a bit uh, um, crazy so like uh, of course first thing, you need to learn the basics you need to know your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript and then you need to have general development skills. So those are like you need to know it. You need to know your HTTP and HTTPS protocols. Uh, of course, the most important one is that you need to know how to search for solutions. You need a Google skill, and followed by you know some data structure algorithms and design methods and so on. So those are general like uh, development skills that you need to know before jumping to React. Then in React, right? So there's a bunch of things that, that are spawn of React. So you, you have your view tools, you have your styling components, you have your state management, and, and so on and so forth. So what, what I'm showing, what, the reason I'm showing this is that you will notice that state management is actually part of uh, the things that you will encounter uh, later on in your React project. <coughs> that everyone's familiar with uh, React states and props and etc. Right. Um, so to recap, right, uh, for a simple React component, uh, it's so this is a simple React component that is React state involved. So it just has uh, the props and here you can render the components by and, and parse in the names and you'll know how to render the results. And this is another example when the state is involved. So say for example, say for example here we have a, a timer component and it is ticking every second. And how we do it is that we will have our state that's yet managed in, in the component. And we will set a timer, uh, so basically every second we will call our tick functions to update our second. So in React, uh, you in React you will describe your uh, UI in this render functions, and how the the only uh, the only times when the render functions will get called uh, when changes are done is is either true props or either true states. That's the only two uh, uh, points that React uh, when render functions call. That we call the render function, sir. Right. So, if let's say we are using um, uh, React React component states to manage our states without any external libraries, um, this is this is a problem that uh, you might face later on. So say, say for example, this, imagine that this is a uh, your applications where you have nesting components. So say the A could represent your application, and B could be a sections in your page, and then D would be uh, some parts where uh, you it could be that uh, it's a, it's a uh, input fields that you type in text and and so on. Then the problem is when, let's say, if, if the state is just in the D itself, uh, there's no issue there because you can just put in your states in, in the D nodes here, and there's, there's no issue. The problem comes when you want to share the states to your other components, say, for example, our E friend here. So how would you do? do uh, how would you solve this? You will basically have to, uh, instead of storing the states uh, in the D nodes, you have to pass it to all the way up to the A nodes and then pass it down to D. So uh, if just three level of involvement is probably fine, but you will imagine that in your typical application you have multiple nesting components. So you probably have to pass down like you know, multiple levels up and downs. So it's a bit um, shitty if you code it that way. Uh, I mean you will find it shitty if you code it that way. Um, 
So here, here you visualize the, uh, uh, the example that I gave. So let's say in our denotes, we have a text field here. So whenever, whenever we type in, we will uh, update our inodes. So yeah. So in Redux, the way to solve this is by uh, having an external store, and every every child, every components of your uh, React, you will uh, subscribe to the source. So whenever uh, you want to access the states, you just go and ask the store, say, oh, uh, can I have my uh, text input? And then they will just pass it down to you. So there's no more like you have to uh, pass the props from the parents to your child and then to your child and to your child. And, and the same uh, goes if you want to update your states in your store, right? So you will have uh, actions uh, in, in inside stores to update it. So, so the basic concepts of uh, Redux is pretty much like the diagram I showed here. Uh, some, sometimes I feel like Redux can be quite scary uh, and it's quite hard to learn, but if you know this three concept, it's pretty much the sum of Redux. <laughs> And so, so what this represents is like sort of like a grinder, right? So in order for you to come up with your outputs, which are states, right? You need to put in your actions, and then it will pass into this reducer, and then it will output you a new state. So that's sort of like a uh, short summary of it. And another representation. So let's say, uh, let's say we have so we have our actions. Whenever we trigger actions. It goes to the reducer, and then reducer will um, reducer will uh, take the actions and then give you the next state, and then it will store it into your store. And then your store, if if your UI is subscribing to the store uh, changes, then you will update it. You will get new state changes, and then your UI will update it. So, so the three things remember the three things: uh, action, reducer, and store. Uh, so inside Redux world, uh, action is pretty much uh, just like an object. It's a it's a pure object. It describes uh, what's what is your what's the changes. So uh, the mandatory things in uh, the actions is that you need to put in uh, you need to have your types property, and then it will be a, a, a constant value, and then the rest will be some of the payloads that you want to pass to your reducer, which I'll, I'll show it from uh, Then you have your reducer. Reducer is basically a pure function which refers to next state. I think this line uh, uh, this line is pretty much sums up what is reducer quite clearly. So what, what it does is that it's a function that takes in the previous state and your actions and then you will do all the new state the next things. So uh, the important thing to note is that uh, reducer needs to be uh, a pure function, meaning that uh, it cannot have dependencies and it, it, uh, it has to be yeah, immutable. So in so so, so, so this this example here is that so if we pass in a action called sort plugins, right? Um, it will it will return us a new state, and it will return us a new state based on the actions here. I'll show an example later when uh, to explain more. The the last uh, last concept is that uh, you have your store. Uh, store is a plain object which holds your application state. Uh, and your application states is pretty much just like a JSON object that is describing your uh, applications. And the only way that you can uh, update the states is you have to show a dispatch. Uh, but you have to call the dispatch functions by and also passing it and describing your uh, actions. Right. So that. Probably sounds a bit like too 
uh, uh, maybe and it doesn't have any context. This this example here, which I grabbed from uh, Redux uh, website, is pretty much sums up uh, the whole re uh, Redux in actions. So you have so in this example here, right? You have your uh, reducer, which uh, here we call, which is a function we call a uh, calculator, and it it has a default state zero and is taking uh, actions. So if we pass in the actions for each recruitment, it will just return the new state and then increase the state. And if we pass in the uh, decrement uh, actions, it will just take the states and then uh, reduce the count. And if we if our actions doesn't uh, uh, match the switch case yet, then it will just return the default state. Next, then uh, so I'll talk about the store code. Then we need the store that is holding uh, your states. And to create the stores, uh, you just have to pass in the root reducer, your reducer to your uh, store function. Uh, the third piece of uh, the store implies that you can, whenever it changes, uh, whenever you fire actions, right, you can subtract to the you can subtract to the changes. So here uh, we are passing callbacks to the uh, subscribe methods, and whenever we fire actions, then we will just console log um, the state. So if you then when you want to set actions, you will just use uh, store. You call this dispatch functions in store, and then pass in the action. Yeah. So say if we pass in types increment, it will in our console logs we will find it uh, output one, and if we increment it in, then we will output two, and so on. Example. So let's say we take this uh, Redux concepts and we put it into uh, a simple vanilla uh, HTML. So here we have our uh, counts, which is uh, initially zero, and then when we press uh, when we increase it or decrease it, it will update. So if we do this in vanilla uh, vanilla HTML and JavaScript, this will be how it looks like. So we have our HTML. Um, and then we have our JavaScript here. So here is the reducer functions that you saw earlier. And basically, uh, it understands the, the actions that you are telling the reducer to do, and then you uh, update it accordingly. Then um, you will have to create your store, which is holding all the states. And then just, uh, in the vanilla gesture, you will have a function that is uh, that that will render the states outputs and then uh, put it inside the value element. So whenever we have new changes, uh, whenever we dispatch actions, and then it will do our new states, then it will call uh, our render function. So and here we are just attaching uh, event listeners, click event listeners uh, to the buttons. So for increments, we will then dispatch uh, increment actions. And for decrements as well, dispatch uh, decrement actions. So then with all of this, right, then you have your, uh, you have your vanilla HTML that is implemented using Redux. Feel free to throw your questions and drop me. So, uh, so, so, what about using Redux in uh, React? So, I have an example here that that will show uh, how you can use Redux in how you can use Redux in React. Uh, so, say here we have our uh, to do applications. So if we type in a new stuff, 
it will just render into the list. So the and the apps components pretty much that we have our uh, app to do form and then we our to do list. So when you want to integrate this with uh, Redux, right? You need to uh, you need to create a store and passing in the root reducer. And have, once you have your store instance, then you'll be pass you need to pass that store instance to the provider. And uh, with React and Redux, they actually have the official bindings, uh, which is called uh, React Redux, and it's quite it's pretty much like the gold standard if you want to use Redux and React together. So we'll be using uh, this uh, library here. And and in, in this index file here, this pretty much sums up uh, how this is pretty much the big, uh, first steps to set up uh, Redux. So if we navigate to the apps, uh, like I said before, it's pretty much just render the app to do components and uh, to do this. So if we go into uh, app to do, it's basically a, a simple forms and have a text uh, input and a submit buttons. So once when uh, we submit the values, it will go and trigger the on submit function in forms. And here, uh, here we are just uh, calling the dispatch functions to to add the uh, we are calling the add to do uh, actions to add our new uh, to do. So in, in our actions, right, how it looks like is uh, you have uh, the, uh, what we are taking is, is a new uh, text uh, parameters and then we are adding a new uh, ID here. So in, in our reducer for the to do's, we can see that uh, whenever we receive an action called app to do, it will uh, grab the values that we set in our, in our actions and then uh, create a new uh, array items in our array. Then uh, in the to do list, um, here we, in the to do is how we are getting uh, all the uh, states in the store is we have to call the connect functions uh, from React Redux and then pass in the map states from. Uh, what this is doing is that uh, once uh, once we receive the new changes or once there's the new changes, it will uh, trigger this uh, function here and here here uh, whenever this is triggered right, it will give you the whole states and then what we are interested in that state is that we just want our to do so here we are uh, passing creating object that just have to do so it uh, what this will do is that it will uh, Put in the uh, it will grab the states from React so and then put it and pass it to the to do list as a props and then you can access that uh, properties here and then do a map functions to render out the uh, to do items. Right. 
whenever um, to summarize when you want to set up uh, to set up Redux in, in React, you have to uh, pretty much this this is the boilerplate. You have to create your stores and then you have to wrap um, your application with the provider by passing the store. And afterwards, whenever you want to uh, subscribe to the changes uh, in your components, you just have to call the connect functions and and uh, pass in the function pass in the function to describe how to select the states out of the uh, store. And then what it will do is that it will just automatically put the, the properties uh, into your components. And when, whenever you want to uh, make updates to your stores, you have to use uh, the set functions, which you get uh, by wrapping uh, your, your component with the connects. So I know that probably doesn't explain it quite well, um, but here, here are the advantages of using uh, Redux, right? Uh, with, with this kind of flows, it will make your state changes predictable. Um, so uh, whenever you have some state change, you can always look back uh, to what actions causes it. And uh, is it like a typical uh, uh, two ways binding systems where you have your models and your models uh, will update some UIs. So it, it gets a bit crazy. It also scales up with big uh, applications. And, uh, it, so by that, I mean once, uh, because, because your states is, uh, become more predictable, so when you have a lot of states to manage, um, Especially when you have go fix, then React uh, Redux is kind of a good fit. And it makes your codes uh, quite maintainable. Uh, it has increased your code maintainability as well as uh, it uh, will uh, provide uh, organized structures to your projects. Uh, it also uh, makes it easy to debug your state changes. So I'll show uh, an example. So in Redux, there's an extension called uh, that's developer tool. So there's a Chrome extensions uh, called Redux uh, Developer Tools. So if you have set up a project uh, with using uh, this developer tools, what you will give you is that it will It will let you track all your uh, actions uh, in your Chrome Dev Tools. So you can see that I have added a new uh, to do, and here this is the text that I've typed in. And if I add a new one, you can see that I have a new uh, to do here. And if you have navigate to the states, you can see that. Uh, right now, the state is holding a to do uh, array, and these are these are them. So, so if I can, uh, so if I my items to complete, I can. You can also see that uh, the actions are there. Uh, what what is powerful with all of this, right? It uh, actually allows you to do uh, time travel, time traveling. So say imagine uh, if you have ends up in, if your client manage application ends up in a state that uh, it's very hard to debug what's been happening because there's just way too many actions firing and it's hard hard for it to track. Uh, if you have this installed, it you you can actually use these uh, features to traverse back to your history state. And, and all of this is possible is because um, all your states, all your variables, right, they are just in a single uh, centralized place in your store. And 
and push makes this possible. And lastly, uh, since all your uh, mutations, your state mutations are all separate into action reducer and stuff, you can make unit test cases uh, a lot easier. And yeah, and that's it. Yeah, if I don't have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks, Hisin, for the talk about Redux. So we have our last speaker here, Song from Sydney, right? Yeah. So he is uh, our emergency speakers to edit up our pretty much last minute. So he gonna talk about very high end stuff. So if you love this sort of like high end Redux stuff, then you gonna love this stuff, right? sponsoring the place and the food. Uh, this kind of event is very important for um, local tech communities, for, so props to everybody for showing up as well. So today I'm going to talk about um, distributing your React apps as a binary. Uh, I'm Tom, I'm from Monomex Software. I'm usually available for hire, you can find more in the, in the Monomex.sh. So today, we're going to talk about how to distribute your React application as a single binary, including your API server and whatnot. So traditionally, um, when you deploy a React app with your API, it works something like this. So there's your server uh, written in Ruby or Node.js or whatever language of your choice. And it reads from the uh, file system um, to serve a React JavaScript bundle with CSS, your font, your image, and stuff like that. And maybe you'll have a re reverse proxy in front, like Nginx or Apache. And then um, uh, finally, the reverse proxy will serve the assets to your user or API response in JSON or XML. But uh, what I would like to talk about in this talk is um, simplifying the process, uh, simplifying the whole architecture so that it becomes more like this. So your server um, program will have a file system embedded in it so that it doesn't have to do the disk I.O. every time um, you want to serve to the uh, client. So what can it do for you? What why should you distribute your React application as a single binary? Well, there are a couple of reasons and a couple of things that this can do for you. So first, it allows users to self-host. For instance, if you have a React application that your users want to, that you want to just distribute to your user for, for them to self-host. Um, if you have like complicated build process, for instance, it will be very hard for users to grab your program and self-host themselves. But if everything is embedded in a single binary, it's going to be very easy for them to just grab the binary and run them on their server. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is that another thing this can do for you is 
it's easier to sell your software in case you're selling your software. Um, for instance, if, uh, if, you want your, if you are selling your uh, React application um, for people to host themselves, maybe their enterprise customers that want to host everything themselves, then if you have just a single binary, then you can just um, sell, the, sell that binary in return for a fee. Basically, setting a license to use a binary. No build process is required in that case. Maybe it can simplify your build process a little. Um, when, you, uh, when you build, I mean, when you deploy your application, all you have to do is maybe just to upload a single binary to your server. And this can save a lot of time in the build process, especially if you are doing something like auto scaling. Um, Maybe if you are, you are spawning more instances as your traffic increases, then all you have to do is to maybe grab the binary from your, um, uh, in case you're using AWS, maybe from S3, you can just grab the binary, spawn in an instance, and then just put up your program without having to do any build process. And finally, no disk I.O. So um, it's going to be, maybe it'll, it'll be good for the latency of your program. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a real-life example uh, called Dnote. Uh, it's totally open source. You can uh, have a look at have a look at the source code on at GitHub.com/dnote/dnote. It's a fully open source uh, note-taking application that I've been maintaining for the past two and a half years. It's completely written in React. So if you're looking for some non-trivial uh, React applications that you uh, that people actually use in production and is fully open source, um, you're welcome to uh, take a look at this. So a little background is that it's using, uh, it's written in Golang um, for everything like API and job processing and uh, everything in the front end is React. So um, again, this has been going on for, the development has been going on for the past two and a half years. So it's very complicated React application. So the basic idea of distributing your React application as a single binary, there are two steps. First, you can write a, first you have to sort of write your backend in a language that can produce a single binary. Maybe you can write your backend in C or Go, uh, things like that, uh, which compiles to a single binary that you can just distribute to your users. And second step is a key, uh, key step. You, you have to embed your static files into your binary instead of your binary doing any disk I.O. to read those files. So then how, how do we embed the static files into, uh, into maybe you have, you'll have a React JavaScript bundle and CSS, uh, like a SAS file or something like that. Well, you can simply write a script. There's nothing that a simple bash script console or you can write, yeah, you can use, uh, there are a lot, a lot of libraries exist to do this work for you. In this example, I'm using a library called uh, Packer. And this slide, by the way, will be available on the Facebook group, so all the links you can uh, follow along with you in there. So this is not exactly JavaScript code, because um, it's my, it's the API uh, server-side API code for uh, the end, but it will give you an idea of how we can, how this program uh, works um, uh, by embedding the whole JavaScript bundle inside the binary. So this function called start command is uh, an entry, entry function for the end. So whenever users grab a binary and they run it, this function will be executed. So it does all the database, um, uh, database stuff and also calls the mailer to um, initiate all the email stuff. Um, and it executes a job like a background job processor on a separate thread, a separate process. And then finally it initializes the server. Initializes the server. So there are a lot, lot going on inside the single binary. Um, first there's a, well, we are handling the database I.O. 
and then background job processing, and then we also have a server. And server is responsible for serving the API response as well as the React application, uh, uh, React JavaScript bundle, and uh, CSS files and fonts. So we're going to have a look at the um, couple of things. So this in server uh, function uh, is going to do two things. First, it's going to spawn a reverse proxy uh, to forward all the API requests that are prefixed by slash API into an API server, an API response handler that's inside. And we are actually interested in uh, get a handler. So everything else other than API will go into this handler. And this is where the uh, where the magic happens. So um, this by using this abstraction called Tacker, uh, we were able to um, embed everything, all the React JavaScript bundle inside the binary. And if you can see this. Um, uh, HTTP handler. So basically, this um, just takes a request and response object. If you're familiar with Node.js web servers, that's the same. It's the same concept. Uh, request and res request and response. Uh, everything, all all the requests basically we serve index and HTML as a web shell. Um, and notice that we don't do any disk. Uh, disk seeking, we don't even touch the disk. Everything is embedded inside this single binary. And all the other all the other if we have a if we have a HTTP request that starts with slash dist, then it um, finds a um, finds a necessary uh, asset like a JavaScript bundle image or your font file, your React or your React uh, JavaScript bundle. Again, we don't do any um, any sort of um, disk seeking, so there's no need to touch the disk. Or for you, your users don't even have to worry about um, uh, building, grabbing any JavaScript file, or running Webpack configuration or stuff or stuff like that. Everything is uh, abstracted uh, inside this handler. So right now the architectural diagram looks like this. So you have a single binary called uh, Denote Server, and inside it many, many different things are running concurrently. Uh, one of them is file system. We have we have effectively created an abstraction abstract abstraction over the file system, and directly embedded that into the binary. Uh, this, uh, now our React application is entirely encapsulated inside the binary so that your users don't have to worry about um, even they don't even have to have any JavaScript runtime on their machine in order to run this program or they don't even have to know if React even exists they just need to they just need a machine with um, that can execute the binary which can be Binary can be compiled for Linux, Mac OS, or Windows, FreeBSD, any kind of platform. Because it's binary, I mean, binaries are, uh, you can compile it across platform anyway. So the magic of this is that your users don't even have to know that the React, React exists in order to use your React application. So as I said, uh, there are two benefits of this approach. Uh, this can, this can, uh, in your current or next React application that you want to, that you want to now want to distribute to your users. If you follow this approach, then you can gain portability, which which makes it easier for your users to self-host your React application. Or if you want, if you want to sell your program for an enterprise customer. You can just um, you can just give them a binary. Um, uh, Effectively, uh, you don't have to like give them any build process or um, uh, any any manual. And it's 
it's also another benefit of this approach is that it's very easy to upgrade the software. Say that your user was using your React application version, let's say 0.1.0, and you want to bump the minor version to 0.2.0, all they have to do is to grab a new binary and then run that binary instead of the old binary. So if they had to worry about the React build process and um, stuff like that, Stuff like that, then they will have to maybe grab the new entire code base, configure Webpack and stuff, uh, build build a new um, new JavaScript bundle, uh, which can be quite time-consuming and error-prone. So this talk was about how to distribute your React application and backend in a single binary. So there are a couple of links that I want to share. Again, this slide will be available on the uh, Facebook group. First is the, um, the GitHub link to the project, if you're interested in uh, learning more about the React application and production. And second is the, my Twitch stream. I sometimes do live coding on React, if you would like to check it out. So, that's me, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Yes. between the binary, for instance, maybe users might have configurations for the first binary. Files or databases. Files or databases. Um, well, uh, mm -hmm. in the first case, maybe we'll have a configuration file uh, that the binary reads from um, that is stored outside the binary, inside the user's, um, user's machine. Uh, so we can Basically, we can persist any data we, we need to migrate to the second binary uh, into a separate file and user machine. Or any, any other states, really, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, it doesn't really, uh, probably not a very good idea to persist any data inside your application anyway, because it makes your application kind of stateful. So as the uh, as the as you said, it's a good idea to uh, use a database and stuff like that, which uh, uh, provides us with a, another layer uh, detached from the binary to store all our data. So that was a good question. Yes. So all of this So I'll ask the first question first. So the first question was, how does this compare with Electron? Um, yeah, that, is, uh, that is actually a good question. Uh, Electron, uh, so this, uh, this is similar to Electron in that uh, maybe you, you can, in that you can distribute your React app uh, in a, as a single thing, a single entity. Uh, but Electron is a, uh, as, as far as I understand, it run, it's a wrapper around uh, Chrome. Um, so you can run client-side applications uh, with the UI and stuff with Electron. But th with this approach, you can also run server-side applications. Um, maybe you want to run your binary on your server and serve, it, serve, the, serve your React applications using uh, HTTP server and stuff. So that, that was, does that answer your first question? And your second question was? Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, so the second question is, do I have an example of, uh, of a React application wrapped in a binary? Um, 
actually you can find it at the, at the previous slide. Uh, so Dnote is actually fully open source, free and open source software under GPL license. So it's free and it's distributed freely um, as a single binary. All the server and client source code uh, you can download freely and they are all, uh, the React application itself is all encapsulated in a single server binary. And if you're curious about the build process and stuff, uh, they are all open source as well if you, in case you are wondering how it's done. Yes. So the question was, uh, compared to distributing uh, React JavaScript bundle uh, in a traditional way, maybe what are some performance implications in terms of uh, memory footprint or uh, file size? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, so the answer is um, that I haven't actually benchmarked, uh, benchmarked this, so I can't say for sure. But since all you're doing is embedding the JavaScript bundle inside binary, which is essentially a find and replace uh, operation, I, I would assume that, again, this is an assumption not backed by any evidence, but I would assume that uh, there's, no, there's no difference in the file size actually being transmitted over the wire to the user. Uh, the performance gain would be that now your app doesn't have to seek your, uh, seek, do any disk seeking to um, serve the file. Then again, uh, most, I mean, a lot of production application nowadays, they use CDN of some sort instead of uh, doing disk seeking every time. Maybe they have a cache layer, uh, like HTTP cache, like Varnish, or maybe they have a CDN like CloudFront or Cloudflare. So in this case, I would say it's very hard to definitively say which one is better. Thank you very much. All right, thanks so for the talk. Okay, so this concludes our meetup for today.